So I think I'll start with the website. So basically the marketplace is a website, obviously. So we'll go through the website, then do a um, quick tutorial about how to make a chain link request, then turn that into a chain link request to a Honeycomb API. And then we can go over the hackathon submissions um, as a break, and then go on, like, work on some uh, more advanced examples. So well, to give my take, what does chaining do? Why do we need chaining? Well, the Oracle problem is quite an abstract way of putting it. We need um, chaining to make API calls in our smart contracts, I think, is a better way of putting it. So what does an API do? So for example, we can uh, look at our APIs here. So basically, there are two types of services that an API can provide. One, it can have some sort of data silo that they have access to and nobody else does, and that data is valuable, and they would sell this data, basically. So for example, um, real-time market data is not available to everyone. If I have access to that data, I can sell that data through an API. So that is one way of um, monetizing uh, something with an API. The other is um, you can provide a sort of a computation. For example, if there is this expensive computation that someone needs to make, then you can do it for them and charge them for it. So this is a, a way of setting up an API that doesn't need a data silo, but still it is basically a paid service. So the thing is we, can't, we don't have access to external data in our smart contracts, so we need those kind of APIs. And it is difficult to do computation on blockchain. We need those kind of APIs. And we can't affect the outside world, so we need APIs that can affect the outside world. For example, here we have this Neutrino API and there is an endpoint to, for example, send an SMS message. So you cannot send an SMS me message in your smart contract. You need to call an API that can send an SMS message for you. And without chain link, you cannot call an API, so you don't have access to this functionality. Chain link allows you to call APIs and gives you this functionality. But then if you can do it on chain, for example, Chaining, in a way, allows you to do it through a single chain link node. I wish I didn't close the presentation, but, but as soon as you can do it with one on-chain, then you can do it with multiple on-chain and then aggregate on-chain. So you can actually do this in a decentralized way if you can do it with a single node. So basically, if I want to send an SMS message and I want to make sure that it goes, then I would have multiple requests all um, sending the SMS message, and at the end of the day, it will probably go through. So APIs do this, and the good thing with APIs is they were here before blockchain. So for example, if you go to the documentation of this API, this is basically a service that you would use to, uh, for example, uh, build a website, build a uh, smartphone application. Basically, um, you would be using this to build Web 2.0 applications. And because of this, there's a lot of these. And then as soon as you have these become available on the smart contract, then like, it allows you to uh, implement a lot of different use cases. And what we do is, so this chaining a lot. So let me open the chaining documentations. So here you can go to docs.chain.link, and there is, for example, this um, segment about contract creators. So what you would need. Um, 
true to use Chainlink in your contract. So here, for example, there are some decentralized oracles. Let's say that we did all of this, and now we, we need to integrate the oracle. And there are some listings here. Oh, one of them is us. But the thing with these, these listings is it allows you to call APIs that serve everybody uh, without, without being paid. So th there are actually some APIs. For example, a lot of the block explorers for, for example, Bitcoin, you can call them and they answer. And, but the reason that service is not paid is um, blockchain data is already open to everyone and it is quite difficult to monetize it. So people just give it away. But if the service is actually valuable and not many people have, can provide that, most of those services are paid. And these listings uh, can only call APIs um, that are not paid. So they, the APIs that are not authenticated because the paid APIs give you an API key and then uh, you pass that API with your request and then the API knows that you have actually paid for this service and then responds to you. So the problem is a lot of the useful services are paid APIs, then these don't have access to them. And what you would need to do as a smart contract developer is um, you would first, so yeah, I will go ahead and open this. So let's say I'm a smart contract developer. And I want to call this API. I first need to set up a chain link node. And then I need to subscribe to the API, pay for it. And then I need to interface that API with my chain link node. And then call my chain link node to call the middleware, to call the API. And I get the response back. But even then, so this is a lot of stuff to do, basically. You, if you're a smart contract developer, why would you want to run a chain link node? Is one problem. You want to use this API for a single project. Why do you want to uh, develop the external adapter between the API and the chain link node? That is pretty inefficient. That's another problem. A third problem is, so you run the only node between the API and the smart contract. So you can tamper with the data that goes through that node, but then nobody would trust that. So you need other nodes to also sign up to this API, so pay for the data, and then run your middleware and then answer. That is pretty difficult. And even then, the standard API terms of services would not allow this use case. So basically here, the nodes are subscribing to this API, for example, for $100 a month, but then they are reselling each call, let's say, for a dollar. And the terms of service does not, most of, the, most of them explicitly say that you cannot resell or redistribute this data. And even if they don't, it is quite vague. And when asked, uh, well, API providers say that they wouldn't allow that use case. So basically what we do is we solve all of those problems. So we have all of these APIs. We have authenticated access to all of them. Uh, they all um, signed service agreements to um, like deliver a high quality of service. So um, nor, for example, if you call them too frequently, Maybe your rate would, call rates will be throttled. Like we don't do that kind of stuff. And then they allow, the, they know that their data is going to be resold for each call. And then they price their calls accordingly. Then that becomes okay. So they give uh, permission for reselling. And then we develop the external adapter so that nobody else has to, essentially. 
And then we also partner with a lot of node operators so that if you want to call an API, you can, for example, if we click this API and try to check the connection. So, for example, right now I can call this API on mainnet through five different nodes, which is pretty much the most you can afford for most use cases because it's quite um, expensive at the time because of the gas prices. But essentially all of those problems are solved. So this is the marketplace. So right now there are 21 APIs, more in the pipeline to get integrated, and seven node operators, as I said, like there's plenty for most use cases. And again, we have more to be integrated on the pipeline. And we provide some additional services for um, specifically for smart contract uh, developers because um, for no other features, this is uh, quite a good deal because basically they're not paying anything for API subscriptions. They are not undertaking any financial risk. Basically, whenever a request comes to them, they call the API, they pay the API this amount, but then they resell the call immediately after at a higher price. So there's no risk for them. And for the API providers, this is just another uh, venue to monetize their calls. So API providers like this deal pretty much. And then there are the smart contract developers. For the smart contract developers, we try to make this as easy um, to use as possible. So even though like it is quite difficult to use Chainlink without having this kind of uh, marketplace, we try to even do better than that. So, for example, we have this um, testing interface. So here, you can use our external adapters to make a call to an API to see that what it returns. Because if you're going to be paying for this, then you would want to see what it returns first. So we have the documentation link uh, of the API here, for example. I will open that. So we refer the smart contract developers to the original documentations as much as we can because those are um, up to date. So for example, this is the request format. So here, we first need to pass an access key. Actually, the smart contract developers don't because we do this for them. This is part of the service dealing with authentication. So you wouldn't need to worry about this. But for example, here, it commerce from um, British pounds to Japanese yen and 25 pounds to basically we're asking how many yen would that make. So we enter the parameters as a JSON object. So I'll just copy paste it, but it's basically the variable name in quotations, a semicolon and A comma. We use JSON a lot when working with Chainlink. So, this becomes pretty familiar to people after a time. So, so I'm passing these three parameters. So this is the exact format that my external adapter is going to receive. And this is important because after I get the answer, I want to index the field that I want. For example, here, success true. <laughs> this is not the field that I probably, yeah? Mm, right, let me try. Yeah, so this is the date that he made the query in. But basically, this is the result that I'm looking for. 25 pounds make 3,000 something yen. So uh, now, one, I know um, if this is even working. <laughs> and then in what 
response format does this return the answer because, for example, this API has the response format here, but most APIs don't. So they just assume that you're going to subscribe to them and then try a, a query and then find out what it uh, returns. So this is the um, screen that you can do it at. And after I did this, after I do this, I will integrate this um, endpoint with my smart contract, which we will do a bit later on. But for example, if, and also the second thing that we provide are free Robson um, test calls. Basically, we are allowing smart contract developers to call these paid APIs for free, which is quite difficult to uh, actually uh, figure out with the API providers because uh, obviously these people want to monetize the calls and we are, saying, we are telling them <laughs> actually not monetize these calls. And then we provide this for all APIs on the marketplace right now. So for example, I choose the network type, which is basically what's just wraps in our mainnet. And then I choose the data type that I want the response to be delivered in. And for Robson, we are the only node. So we are not having other nodes uh, provide these test data. So there's only one listing. So here, this is our Oracle contract address. And this is the job ID. So basically, when you're asking the Oracle to deliver data, the Oracle would have to know which data it should deliver. So this job ID is that. And this is the link price that you need to pay. But it is in Robson link, so it is essentially free. So this is pretty much it. The marketplace is actually not that complicated. There are a bunch of APIs. Then you click an API, there are a lot of endpoints. And then you can test them, you can connect to them. These are the main functionalities. So we have the Wi-Fi SSID and password on the board if you need it. So now I will try to make a chaining request. So this is the repo name at clc-group workshop.honeycomb.request. This is quite a um, a simplistic project that only makes a request and displays it. So so this is my project. We have So I have this wallet.json file. I'm copy pasting it in the project folder so I can actually put it in a paste bin, I think. And then you can. So this is basically my wallet mnemonics. So I put, already put some uh, Robson ethers and link there. So. Okay, if you need it, it is going to be here. Where can I write it? Okay. So, I'll first go through the uh, contract. So, this is actually not a call to a Honeycomb API, but rather one of our jobs that creates a random number between a low and a high limit. So this will generate a number between one and six. I have this running at this AWS Lambda function and our node calls the function, gets a random number and feeds it back to you. So this is the name of my contract. It inherits chaining client. 
So in the meantime, let me install the dependencies by saying npm install. So basically, our dependencies are only Chainlink and Truffle HD Vault provider, which it should install in the background. So I first inherit Chainlink client. So we need to inherit this contract to make a Chainlink request, and it is coming from this import. So it has these variables, Oracle payment amount. So it would be 0.1 link. And the job ID is basically the 40 character string that we have seen at a listing. And then we have a result receipt flag and a result. So my result is going to get written into this variable. And when I get the result, this will be set to true. And this is the contract constructor. We have the link token address the Oracle address, the job ID, and the Oracle payment amount. So the, our Oracle contract is this contract that we, as Honeycomb, deployed. And when someone needs to call an API through our node, they make the request to that contract. So obviously, if, you're, if I'm going to make a request to, that, uh, to our node, I would have to um, know the Oracle contract's address. So while constructing this uh, contract, we have the feed in these parameters, which are being set here. Now here's the make request part. So there's no input arguments to this. Basically, we create a chaining request. So this is pretty much the same for all chaining requests, except this part in between. So here we are adding our parameters. And for the random number generator, we have a low and a high parameter. And this is the path of the field that we want to read. For, so for example, let's say, let's call Tatum, because it doesn't need any input parameters. So for example, if I want to get the number of blocks in Bitcoin testnet, I would write blocks here as copy path. And it would call the API. And then it would receive this and then go to the blocks field and return what is written next to it. So we always have this copy path parameter, and these are the API specific parameters. So let's deploy this. We say npm run deploy Robson, which uses Truffle to deploy this contract on Robson. And by the way, I can continue with these. There's a reset result function. Obviously, it resets the result. And a fulfill function. So this is the function that the Oracle calls back when it has the result. And it basically just sets it here. So again, this is something that you have um, in all contracts that you call a chaining Oracle. And now we are doing the migration, so we can Check out what we did there. So we basically just deployed it with the constructor parameters, which were the link token address. This is the Robson link token address. This is the Oracle contract. This is the Honeycomb Oracle contract. And this job ID refers to a specific job that we have created at our node that generates the random number. And this is how much you need to call how much you need to pay per call, which is 0.1. So these are fed in the constructor function. And then we send it some link. So why we do that is a, a contract that needs to make a chaining request would have to pay the Oracle in link tokens. So if we didn't um, 
standard and link tokens while doing the chaining request, it would fail, basically, because it's because the Oracle, um, actually it does not check at the Oracle, but rather at the node. So basically the request, the request goes to the Oracle and the Oracle will say, I received this request, but I didn't get any link. And then the node would look at that and just wouldn't respond because uh, it didn't receive enough link. So basically we need the contract to have link so that when calling this, it can send the respective amount of link tokens. So it is almost deployed. After it is deployed, I'm, go I'm just going to call this test script to um, interact with it. So I'll just call npm run test Robson. So I just I first get the deployed contract. I reset the result in case I'm using this for the second time. And then I get the reset result received and the result variable. So have I received the result? No. And my initial result is initialized at zero. Now I'm making a chaining request using a honeycomb job. So this is a bit different than other solidity functions. So basically when I'm making a request, I'm um, just starting this process of making the request, but then the node should first see this and then call the API, get the response, write it back to the chain. So you don't get the result immediately. So here, when I call make request, I just get a request ID. So right now I didn't get it yet. Once we get it, we can use Explorer to see how it's going. So we got the request ID. It's just saying that using this request ID, you can see how it's going. And our node is uh, connected to this site. It basically pushes all that is happening with the node to the site, Chainlink Explorer, and it appears instantly. And we can actually see the what the job consists of. So here I'm calling the random number generation API and I'm reading my result. I'm not multiplying by anything, I'm multiplying but by one. Turning into an integer and then writing it to the blockchain. So here we are waiting for the request to be fulfilled. What we do is actually uh, we wait for a chaining fulfilled event emitted by this my contract, which it does this because it's a chaining client. So when it gets the um, response, it emits this chaining fulfilled event with this request ID. And when I see this in the code, I'm just saying request fulfilled and breaking from this infinite loop. And then reading the re um, variables again, and we see that they have changed. So now I have received the result, and the final result is one. So this is, if you, this is the most minimal amount of code you need in your contract to make a chaining request. So if you had this um, public listing service where there's all the Oracle addresses and the job IDs, and you found one, now you can just plug it in and make a request to that API. And the fact that we can print this, these variables here means that now they're on blockchain. So my contract can have any kind of logic in it that would use this data and implement any kind of use case. So here I'll quickly show how you would, for example, add one of the Honeycomb APIs. So, I came up with this use case yesterday, actually. So, let's say I want to call this browser bot. 
So what this endpoint does is it emulates the browser. Basically, it uh, calls the website and returns whatever that website returns. So for example, I'll say, uh, for example, I'll say URL honeycomb.market and click execute. So now API is running a browser emulator and going to the honeycomb.market page and it's going to return us uh, what it got. So it has this content. Obviously this. We can't directly use it but there is this selector parameter so you can use these CSS labels to get for example let's say you can for example have a selector so that you only receive this line join the Honeycomb smart contract hackathon so that you can for example have some kind of use case that depends on if this has this message or something else but we're not going to do that, but let's scroll down to the other fields. So we have this HTTP status code. So 200 is success, meaning that our website is up. And is HTTP OK? True, this basically means that, again, the website is up. So I will just get this field. So. In the contract, I'm changing copy path with is HTTP OK? Because that is the field that I want to read. And these parameters will change. So instead, we'll say URL. And you can mark it. The thing is, the result is now either true or false. It used to be an integer here. So I will change the data type. I'll say Boolean. And here again, Boolean. So what else do I need to change? We, I need to change the job ID. So here, while deploying the contract, we were feeding some um, parameters here. So I'll close this, open connect. Robston, I want the return data type to be bool for so this one. The Oracle address didn't change because we only have one Robston Oracle. So I will not change this. So as you can see, it says it's 4A something. So it's not this. But the job ID should change because now instead of the random number generator, I'm using browser bot. And the price is again 0.1 because uh, in testnet, they're all point one link. So we don't need to change that. So that's basically it. So now we can just deploy it again. So we need to deploy it because the contract changed and the contract constructor parameters changed. So it needs to be deployed again. So what can we build with this endpoint? Is I think pretty obvious, is it? We can have a sort of an SLA, a hosting SLA. So for example, I can, my hosting company can say that, well, if your website ever goes down, you're going to receive this compensation. So this contract would have some, for example, ether locked in by the hosting company. And then if I ever see my website go down, I can trigger the contract which would make a chaining request to the API. And if HTTP OK would return false. And in that case, the contract would release all of its funds to me, the customer. So that is basically a way of doing SLA trustlessly. And even a better way would be not using an API, but having the 
chain link nodes run their own browser bots because you don't need some external data for this. You just need to call the website, see if it is there or not. So you don't need an API. You can just run your own thing. But on the other hand, this takes some, like a lot of memory and stuff to run, unlike other external adapters. So, or maybe you can use multiple APIs. That would also work. But after we, or in fact, let me just go to the while it's being deployed. So this is actually the SLA contract that I was mentioning. So it just has two variables, the URL and the address of the website owner. So constructor is a payable function. So while I'm constructing this, I am giving the URL of the website and the address of the website. This part is the same. While fulfilling, if result is false, transfer to the website owner all of the balance of this address. And while deploying this, I am feeding in the URL and the address of the owner of the website, but I'm also sending in point one ether so that if the website owner can ever detect any downtime, they can trigger the contract and get this point one ether. So obviously this is missing. Like there should be some kind of mechanism that would allow the SLA provider to stop giving the service. So for example, if the subscription uh, is ended, then the SLA provider would get the point one ether back. But this is like as simple as that. You would probably want some kind of a contract factory that deploys this. So instead of deploying a new contract for each SLA, you would have this SLA deploying contract. But once you have this boilerplate code of making a chain link request, basically this is the, sorry. So this is the difficult part. And integrating the honeycomb into it is kind of the easy part. And even uh, building your use cases, again, not that difficult. So this is still deploying it. So what we want to see here is I'm going to test this contract and the Robson node is going to call the API, which is going to go to the website and see that it is actually up. So it will return true when I run the test. And with this, if I deployed this, the SLA contract, I wouldn't be able to get my money back because this result is always going to be true because the website is up. So if we somehow um, had the website down to make this demo, then maybe we can get it back, but at the current state we can't. So it is deployed. I'm running the test script again. So by the way, we have these. So when you go to the marketplace, there are these documentations which takes you to the wiki. So there are these workshops. So for example, this is the example project um, that I used right now. And here, there's a video where I go over the example project and explain everything about it. And then in these four examples, um, I am e exchanging the job with uh, 
with a one that belongs to one of these APIs. So the difference between these is I am returning the data as different data types. So if I have this number that can be a positive or a negative integer, then I would use a signed integer. Or if this was some kind of price, or for example here, um, Bitcoin mining difficulty, it makes sense to have it as an unsigned integer. Or if it returns true or false, a Boolean type. Or if it returns a string, then we would use a byte 32. So there are these um, examples of using them. And then, so this is something that we did for the hackathon. So basically how you would add a React frontend to a chain link smart contract because like a lot, a lot of the people, like some people have no problems with the front end, but they do with the smart contract, or some can write smart contracts quite well, but don't know how to integrate them with front end. So there is a workshop that explains how to do that. And then another workshop that, for, so for example, in this contract, we are calling a single API, a single endpoint of a single API. So here, here um, this is about how you would call two different APIs. So you need minimal changes. And then in the fourth one, what if there were multiple users using the same uh, contract, making uh, different chaining requests in parallel? Then again, you need to make some minimal changes. And then there are some more resources if you are interested. So initial result is false, but since the website is up, we expect the true here. So after this, I'm planning on going through the hackathon submissions as a kind of a break. So yeah, we got the result. It is true. The website is up. If we had an SLA, we wouldn't get the compensation because it's up. But in, the con in this contract that I have shown, this would release the funds if the Oracle returned false, which happens when the website is down, basically. So yeah, I will quickly demonstrate the winner submissions to the hackathon. So we had three sponsors, Chainlink, World Weather Online, and Tatum. World Weather Online is obviously a um, weather data provider, and Tatum um, has these, they have these um, nodes in different networks, and they open their, the node APIs, and they provide it as like traditional APIs so that, for example, There are some Bitcoin endpoints and Binance coin endpoints and Ethereum coin endpoints, Ethereum endpoints and Ripple endpoints. And I guess they will be providing Libra and other stuff. So these two were the sponsors and they had their own prize pools and chaining at theirs. And then we um, were offering some prizes ourselves. So the first place was Link swap. So can we open this? So this is basically a um, trustless way to trade Ethereum for Bitcoin. Um, what you do is you first create a contract between the parties 
and then you lock some ethers in it and then the other party makes the transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain and then um, the Tatum API is used to verify that uh, the transaction has taken place and after that the Ethereum is released to the other party so that you can um, trade ethers for BTC in a trustless manner so obviously you would ideally use multiple APIs and multiple node operators and even more ideally node operators would run Bitcoin nodes rather than calling an API but this is more of a proof of concept so this was this is actually one of the um, main things that chaining promises essentially like um, chain interoperability so being able to use chains together and allowing chains to affect each other so this is um, one of the first examples of that so it and also again it is implement, implemented pretty well so this is why we um, ordered the first place for it and the second one is forex trader again another very good um, application so this is link swap is maybe a more traditional trading application while forex trader is uh, more of a DeFi application you can call it so um, actually <laughs> the so this was the second place in our hackathon so maybe Michael can you maybe say you can explain it better than me What API were you using, Fixer? Sorry, what did you say? Were you using Fixer for this? Yeah, I was using Fixer. Yeah, so for example, the one that we, um, I think, used in one of the, we tested it basically. So this API, it is a Forex API, basically gives, gives Forex rates, and then you can call, for example, the latest endpoint, get the latest um, currency rates, and again this is for example a good proof of concept of how you would use it so and I noticed that Michael was from New York so I invited him and so thanks for coming and the third place was won by Helios so this is a decentralized weather futures trading platform So this won the third place and also the first place in the World Weather Online Challenge. So yeah, just like any other derivative product, you can buy or sell weather features and th they are using these interesting um, in a way indicators some kind of complex stuff that um, somehow represents the weather the hotness and stuff and then it is basically a two-sided thing where one says it will be for example this kind of weather and the other would say uh, the opposite and then basically they trade on uh, they trade on that so yeah, heating to Gide's index. So these are our top three. And the chaining judges awards were given to Honeydex. So Honeydex is, again, similar to LinkSwap. Um, a crop insurance step 
called earth crop and easy rental again so this is this allows you to rent some equipment but the equipment depends on um, basically the if you are going to be use, using the equipment depends on the weather so for example you are renting some ski ahead of time so you ensure that rental based on weather so these three were the um, they received the judges awards and agri-insure and EY agri-insure again a crop insurance step and EY an event insurance app. So these two get the World Better Online awards and yeah, LinkSwap was using Tatum said, so they also got the Tatum prize. So we had 16 submissions and these very good six winners. So we were pretty happy with the turnout and we are planning to uh, have some more hackathons in the future. So this as you can see, there are a lot of uh, weather-related depths, and the reason is basically that there are more prizes for, like, provided by World Weather Online. So this is a good precedent for other API providers to um, basically providing more prizes for the future hackathons because it just works. It gets depths built on your API. So uh, we are planning to do more hackathons and have some more uh, API specific prizes, so you can be on the lookout for that. So we can quickly do a DAP with a front end. So this one we did with um, Dan Forbes from Chainlink. So this is. This was a Honeycomb Chaining Workshop sample project, so I'll clone this. So here we have a project inside a project. Again, you can find this uh, later here. And you go to honeycomb.market, go to docs, and it is here, honeycomb workshop chaining. Um, yeah, this one. So basically there's a video of it, but I'll quickly go over it. So basically the outer folder, the outer directory is for the smart contract and there's a client directory and this is for the front end. So let me start by installing it and also we need the wallet.json file again I, I'm uh, we're using this to deploy the contract So I go inside the client directory and I also in install that. So if you look at the contract, there is this general betting pool contract and then a soccer betting pool, which, is, which basically inherits from betting pool and implements this special case. So the betting contract is a two-sided betting contract. So there is the outcome A and outcome B. People send for example, two person bets on the outcome A, one ether each, and then another person bets on outcome B, again one ether, then you don't need odds, basically the winning, the winning side gets all of the payment, and then they get the payment according to their initial bets. Let's deploy this. So this is basically keeping uh, who bet on what and how much. And then we have, this should be familiar from the previous project, Oracle payment amount and the job ID. And we are keeping the total bets here. And then this is 
my result basically if it is fulfilled or and if team A win, won. So either the team A wins or the B. So we have some function for betting and then you use withdraw to withdraw when you if you won and then a, a getting function to get how much you have bet. And then the soccer betting part is basically we make the chaining result here. We, we make the chaining request here. So we pass a match ID and we are using data sports group API for this. So for example, or I guess, I guess we'll need to wait this to deploy. But here the, yeah, okay, you're done. I'll go to client and run the front end. So now we deployed our contract on the Robson network, but I'm going to be running this front end locally, but still everything will be happening on the blockchain. So I deployed a betting contract for this specific match. So I defined those here. So we feed these as like constructor arguments to the contract. Here, match ID and names of the team A and team B. And then nobody has bet yet. So I will bet on um, Milan here because I'd like to win. So this is a match in the past, obviously, because I want to get the result now. But if like this was a real use case, this would be a match in the future, and I will be um, closing the bets before sometime um, the match starts. But this example has none of that. So we are basically betting on a past match. So I bet on this. I click request result, which makes a chaining request. So the request that it makes is to data sports group. So we have not basketball, but soccer. Get matches. So I'll, hmm. Let's troubleshoot in real time. Bad instruction. So it tends to say this when the contract doesn't have link tokens, which it doesn't. So I need to send it some link. One link should be enough. This is odd because hmm. Yeah, I thought I changed this, but I didn't. So normally while deploying this contract, you would have some additional lines here that also sends some link tokens so that it can make um, Oracle chaining requests. But this example doesn't have that, so that's why it failed. So let's wait for the link tokens to go through and then repeat our request. Hmm.
I have to repeat this. And it worked when I repeated, so I'll try that again. So in the meantime, you can test this end, um, API endpoint. So looking at the parameters here, we only need to feed in the ID and the type. So the ID is the match ID that we got here. And type should be match. Okay, it went through. So now I'm requesting the result. So again, it's a, it is saying requesting the result to be delivered because we are now making the chaining request, which is like a chain of events. And while it is doing that, we will check out the test results. So we have, so for example, it says confirmed transaction, but we don't get the result yet because the only the chaining request transaction is confirmed. This is not the, it doesn't mean that we got actually the result. So for example, this returns this object, which has one field data sports group. And then when you open that, there's math, no, there's competition. And then you go to season and then you go to rounds and then you go to match. And then you go to winner, and it says team B. So while determining this copy path, we have this basically indexing path data sports group that competition that season that runs that match that winner. Basically, for you to be able to write this, either you need very good API documentation. So for example, here do we. Yeah, most of the time it is pretty difficult to like find out what you did wrong. So <laughs> the best thing to do would be like <laughs> get it right in the first time. So for example, this is the API documentation that you would have normally. And then it gives you the input parameters. Oh yeah, it has a response example actually. So this is one of the good ones. So y you can actually use this. But then this is not the exact call that you're going to make. So maybe for your call, the output is going to be different. So this, having this is actually worth a lot to the smart contract developers to be able to use chaining correctly because this is the exact response that we get from the external adapter. And it means that the chaining node is going to get this exact response. And then if you get the indexing right according to this output, then it would work correctly. So basically, this is how you come up with this string. And it is common to make mistakes. So <laughs> if something is not working, this is the first thing to check out. If you are the node operator, you can actually check the node logs. Because most of the time, it says that like I couldn't 
find this field in the output, and then it is pretty obvious to you. But if you're the smart contract developer who's not um, running the node and using someone else's node, then you don't have access to their nodes, their node logs. So then you, you need other tools, basically. So the result is delivered, and Milan has won. And since I'm one of the winners, I can withdraw my winnings. So th this is going to happen a lot more faster because we are not making a chaining request. We, we are only making the chaining request here for the match results. And I should be able to withdraw my winnings as soon as the transaction goes through. And I basically, this is what I have bet minus my gas costs. So I won and got my money back. So in the workshop video, um, where was it? So in this workshop video, we actually the in the example, the first betting case was for any sports match, and we changed that basically what is being bet on with a weather event. Basically, two sides are betting, betting on if weather is going to be good or not at a specific date, and then they're being paid out according to that. <clears throat> 